make it clear. Well, order. Order. Well, I did not make the comment. Well, it's not about taking away rights. It is about giving... Kia ladies and gentlemen. Good evening and welcome to Citizen A, where we wrap the week's current affairs with the best political team on television. Warning. We're as fair and balanced as Fox News. Joining me tonight on my ever-revolving panel of bloggers and opinion shapers. He is a social commentator, broadcaster, and soon to be blogging at the dailyblog.co.nz, Efeso Collins. And she is the deputy mayor of the Auckland super city, the most powerful female politician in New Zealand, Penny Hulse. Welcome to you both. Coming up tonight, issue one, the Auditor General's report clears the PM and Sky City of any corruption, but should John Key be pushing the rules and interfering with deals for the gambling industry of all people? Issue two, new crackdown on beneficiaries pending with asset sales stalling. Will welfare, education and health face steep cuts? And issue three tonight, how many spin doctors does the mayor need and are the criticisms from Kiwi Blog valid? Plus, we'll end the show on a final word. Let's kick things off tonight with issue one. The Auditor General's report into the Convention Centre for Pokies deal has found no corruption, but has been highly critical of the processes used. When a National Party cheerleader like New Zealand Herald columnist John Armstrong is describing the abuse of process as a banana republic without the bananas, you get the distinct impression that John Key's claim that the report totally vindicated him is an absurd conclusion to arrive at. If it's true that the Prime Minister hasn't lost any sleep over this, I'd suggest it's because his doctor has been prescribing him horse tranquilizers, penny 300 more misery machines, as the price we've got to pay the devil for a free convention centre. Is it a sad day for the families of gamblers in New Zealand? Like most Aucklanders, I would be very pleased not to see a single extra poker machine in Auckland. And as Council's just going through its gambling policy, which pretty much, you know, all set in place a sinking lid, we do need to be looking very carefully at this deal. But at the moment, this is Sky City and the government. It's their gig. Do you feel a little disappointed that you've been locked out of this process? It's odd that we've not been included in the discussion, considering it's sort of right in the middle of our rohi, so to speak. Mm, yeah, yeah. I live in the inner city. I walk around the inner city a lot. I see that we have a plethora of pokey machines. Do we need 300 more in the central city? We need to get really clear about how we manage gambling harm in our city. Yeah. You know, what we're doing at the moment is not good enough, and I think we really need to step up. Maybe it's not strictly about numbers, but it's certainly about understanding what's happening in the industry, and it's not great. It doesn't seem like we've got very a, a, a good deal for Auckland. Not only do we have to put up with the 300 poker machines, we also apparently have to put, provide money to promote the convention centre as well. Do you think this is a particularly well um, argue, uh, negotiated deal for, for the people of Auckland? So here's the thing, we, as I say, we haven't been included in the discussions. Ah. We are, as, as a city, you know, obviously a, a huge convention centre for the city's got to be a good thing. Mm. So, you know, let, let's helicopter that out if we can. Secondly, a large construction in the city is going to be good for jobs. Mm. Of course mm. that's mm. right. But we haven't had the chance yet to look at how the numbers stack up with usage of the yeah. convention centre and the realities around that. And then secondly, it does come with this very large price tag of yeah. the X number of, of pokies. So it would be good. We'd be very keen to get involved in that discussion with the government. Uh, Fiso, we want to have a Prime Minister who, who pushes the rules and, and, and forces action through on, on noble things, like you know maybe free education, feed the, the kids, maybe even public broadcasting would like to see a government push the, 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 and bend the rules for that. But that's not what's happened here, is it? John Key has pushed the rules for a bloody gambling industry. Seeing as they take $2 billion per year from the people of New Zealand, don't they have enough friends? Don't, does it, doesn't the gambling industry get enough? Why does it need more? Because they're greedy. Uh, and greedy people just want more. And he's not just pushed the rules, he's changed the rules. He's changed the rules of the game. He's changing laws so that this can all go through. This is completely unacceptable. You think about the Pacific Island families, mostly around South and West Auckland, they're the families, and we jokingly say amongst Pacific families, oh, you go when we have church on Saturday night at the casino and the pokies, everyone's pushing those buttons. Yep. And then we go to church and we've got to give a bit more money. And there's a hope, there's this false hope yeah. that our families are going to find money here. They're not. 
And when we marched with Advance Pacifica, we marched against this change. We marched against having more pokies. And to be honest, there's people saying, oh, we need a convention centre because if we don't have one, they'll go to Australia. Well, I would rather they go to Australia than bring more gambling harm into this country. Should we be building a convention centre off the backs of problem gamblers? Because that's pretty much how they're going to fund this, isn't it? No, absolutely. No, we shouldn't be. This is immoral. And the Prime Minister, whilst he might be cozying up with all his mates and stuff and making sure they get an extra bit after this recession that we've had, you know, Pacific Island people have lived with the recession since they arrived here in 1960. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's we've a pretty made long a recession. It's yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah, but no yeah. one's addressed that recession. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And it, it seems so false to me for the Prime Minister to come out and say, oh, look, there's so much to be gained. Again, the gain is going to come from companies who can afford to go to this convention centre. Mm. So whilst it might seem like a good idea, I think we're not hearing the voices of an underclass. We've created an underclass in this country, most of whom are Māori and Pacific and live in western South Auckland. Uh, Penny, what now for the St James? Of course, the original idea from Auckland Council uh, back before the super city was created was the edge. We're going to purchase uh, the St James, do it up, and that's how they would do the convention centre. Um, now that this has, that's been ruled out completely, do we send the bulldozers into the St James? When, when are they booked? When they booked? There are, and we have this conversation, I feel very guilty, we've had this conversation many, three times, many I times, think, and, many times. You know, I, I keep, keep demanding to know what's going on. And I keep on. waiting till I can kind of come and go, <laughs> yep, here's the yep. plan for the St James. That I, I think, as with, with other heritage buildings in Auckland, the St James is absolutely right up there in the top. Mm. The mayor's met with, with Bob Kerridge and another bunch of fantastic Aucklanders, and they've spent time down there, they've managed to get it opened up and had a look. And I know it sounds like it's moving with glacial speed, but there's a whole bunch of people who love it, and yep. it will be saved, I've so, no doubt. So, so if this convention centre does go through, that doesn't mean it's going to be at the cost of the St James? No. Excellent. Uh, Fezzo pokies are a particular uh, scourge in, in South Auckland, and it was South Auckland that helped win the mayoralty for Len Brown. Uh, this is going on uh, on his watch. Do you think that he's going to get any backlash politically for this? I, I don't know that he will. Um, and... I don't know whether I should say I, I hope he doesn't, but the, the issue here is that our people won't feel the harm immediately. Mm -hmm. They feel the harm when there's trouble in the home. You know, you can domestic violence happens because someone's gone out and spent the rent money in the hope that they're going to get more out of the machine. Mm -hmm. But I don't know that our people are translating that into this is Len Brown's right. problem. So I don't know that he'll get uh, flack for it this time round. But I think if this continues, then... And I think maybe people are seeing it as a national issue. This is a John Key issue, right. and I don't think it will have an impact on Len. Uh, final question to both of you. Should the Prime Minister become personally involved in deals? Categorically not. He can be there to advocate mm. for the good of New Zealand, yep. to set up deals, and that, that's the leader's job. Getting involved in the grubby detail, absolutely categorically not. Isn't it a bit awful that our Prime Minister is pimping for the casinos? Yeah, if he's not over helping out the Warner Brothers lot, he's here doing the casino business. No, he should not be involved at all. Thank you, panel. Moving on with issue two, the Supreme Court ruling looks like it may go against the government, meaning the asset sale agenda will be well and truly derailed. The danger for all of us is that the government have already included the money they thought they would get from asset sales into the budget. Where will the government look to cut if they can't sell assets? Why welfare, of course. Surprise, surprise, the latest round of, round of welfare witch hunts has been launched. This time, draconian new penalties against the partners of beneficiaries that will see them fined $5,000 or staggeringly face a year inside prison. Fessa, if you were worried that John Key wasn't going to be able to fill all his private prisons, fret no more. Here we've got the solution. Are the only people who are going to be happy about this circo the ones running the private prisons? Oh, absolutely. They're thinking, oh, they're rubbing their hands saying, thank goodness we're going to fill these places. We've got enough beds for these people. The, I don't know what it is, but this government loved to pick on vulnerable people who don't have or feel they have a voice in this country. So because nothing else is going right for the national government, they know they're under stress. Look at how well the Greens are polling at the moment. Mm. The national government know they're in trouble, so they've got to go back to their core constituency and start 
ramming things home on beneficiaries. And again, Māori and Pacific are going to be hugely affected by this. And, you know, there was the other woman from, from I think, with the Woman's Refuge who was saying, well, so when a, a person is out of a relationship from, from the domestic violence, do they now get pinged because they've left a relationship where they knew something was going on, but now they're going to get in trouble as well? This is really draconian, and this is a measure by the government to say, uh-oh, oh, we're in trouble in 2013, we've got to get right for next year, let's throw something at the beneficiaries. Welfare fraud per year, $20 million. Uh, tax avoidance, minimum, starting minimum, $140 million to half a billion dollars per year. Uh, if we're going after the partners of the poor, will we be going after the, uh, the partners of wealthy uh, people who know that their partner is avoiding tax? When are we going to be sending the officials into Rimuera? It, we won't be. Not under a national-led government. That will never happen. We will always send them after the poor, the vulnerable, those without a voice. And it's a real shame. There's such an irony here. And again, it's immoral. We're chasing people, the poor, yet we know that there's wealthy people who have this going on. I'd be interested to see what Bronner knew about the way he used to conduct himself as a merchant banker. Yes, the, the, yes. These, this is really sad. And I'm amazed that our, at our city and our country, we don't, it's not like we stand up to it. We just think, oh yeah, okay, sweet ass, let's just accept it because they're bad people. When Bill English, uh, of course, double dipped his housing allowance, mm. um, should we be going after Mary English? I mean, which, if, <laughs> if she knew, what, what, it seems to be that there's one rule for very poor people and another rule for very rich people, Penny. What's going you know, on here? You know, just taking a step back, I have to say, I absolutely agree. This is about let's find the group, to, you know, the group of the week to blame. Mm. And it seems to be, and in reading Joris de Bress's comments, um, you know, it was kind of the Asian community, then the beneficiary community, then mm. local government. And now it's just quicker, you know, local government, beneficiaries, Asian community. Yeah. So it's not our turn this week from local government. but. The reality is, you know, we, we do need to call out the kind of hide your money away if you can afford good lawyers mm -hmm. routine. It, it isn't right. And, to, you know, to bash people when they are most mm -hmm. vulnerable might be popular amongst, you know, the Chester Burroughs Brigade, but it's, it's kind of inhumane and mm -hmm. I think the country needs to see through it. We're targeting solo mothers and their daughters for long-term um, contraception. Uh, we're forcing them to take drug tests so they can't get welfare. And now we're going after the partners of benefit as well. Are we criminalising the poor? You know, the part that concerns me the most is that that is such an easy approach. It's kind of a tabloid approach to mm. policy. We need to be saying, why are these families in poverty? What are we doing to support these, these women, to raise kids, so that these are young people who are then going to go on to get jobs? Mm. What are we doing? You know, it's around living wage, it's around job creation, so that we move on. It's total avoidance of those issues by constantly, you know, blaming. And we do a lot of blaming in this country at the moment. If this with Pacific Island and Māori unemployment three times mm. uh, worse off than Pākehā unemployment, uh, this new crackdown is going to fall heaviest on brown families. Will we have a new era of dawn raids with officials checking bedrooms early in the morning to check if someone's staying over or not? Because that's what they're targeting, specifically, whether or not you're in a relationship and you haven't uh, acknowledge that you're in a relationship. Will we see officials knocking on doors early in the morning to check who's sleeping over? That might be the only way they can catch these families. And so I think we, we could get the new set of dawn raids here. And I think that we're going to make families very fearful. We're going to make them think, oh, OK, what can I do? And I don't think these families are cheating the system. You get the one case that will be reported in the Herald as if it's the norm, because right. we all know that they're the right wing lot. But in the main, these families are struggling to get by. And like Penny's talked about, we need a living wage. There's no way you can call the benefit a living wage. Mm. People are struggling as it is. And when you're in survival mode, you sometimes don't have a choice but to do this. Mm. Now, that doesn't make it wrong, but instead we go and criminalise these poor people who are already struggling to make ends meet. And we're going to get situations because the, the, the rules are quite specific about... If a person's staying at your, your place a certain amount of times a week, then that's considered a relationship, and then you get less, and you don't get as much, yeah. and they're going to be start pinging people for that. I mean, what sort of reaction is that going to have in the community? Yeah, I think it's going to have a majorly negative reaction. Now, the, you know, the government has been saying, oh, you know, we're the state, we're going to be free from families, we're not going to get involved. They're now determining what a relationship is. Mm. I don't know that John Key is a counsellor, mm. has, has a counselling background, mm. so... 
again, they're trying to manipulate what a family is and what they can do. Yeah. Uh, Penny, is there an irony that the weakest members of society have to face a crackdown because the government can't sell public assets to the middle classes? That's effectively what's driving the need to lower the costs here. I mean, is, 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 this, is this a little ugly? I think, the, and I've said this before on this show, the problem is that we are not able to explain to our community exactly what the issues are that are driving the headlines and we remain as a community trapped in kind of tabloid headline policy making rather than digging down and understanding the reasons behind it. I agree. Um, who, who, who benefits finally on this? Who benefits from welfare crackdowns? Oh, the government does, because that's the kind of thing that's going to bring out their voters in 2014. Who benefits from this? It gets local government off the front page, no. That's a terrible <laughs> thing to say. I'll get into trouble for that. Thank you, panel. Moving on with issue three. Mayor Len Brown has come in for a roasting from government pollster and blogger David Farrar, because Len has apparently six comm staff while Labour only has five. Is it a gaggle of spin doctors in the mayoral's office? Uh, Penny, I would have thought for a super mayor who is responsible for 1.5 million people and a sissy that generates 37% of the country's GDP, that six comm staff is incredibly under-resourced. Why is the mayor's office so pathetically resourced? It's an extraordinary thing that this even made the headlines. We, um, the government set up the legislation that set up the super city. It required the mayor to set up a mayoral office and it even set the budget for the mayoral office, which I hasten to add the mayor has never actually fully spent. Mm -hmm. We had, you know, eight mayors, each with, you know, at least two or three comms people. It's a hell of a lot more than just six. Yes. So, you know, I think people just need to do the maths. Len has more invitations than, you know, the Prime Minister probably on a, on a daily basis. And he needs to be out there. He also needs good policy advice. Mm. You know, there's nothing worse than a badly informed mm. politician trying to make it up on the hoop. Absolutely. And, you know, I mean, we, we, we respect people's concerns about us spending money sensibly, but for goodness sake, you know, this is a, an era in which you need to communicate well, and he is, does. Is this a political attack? Of course it is. Why is David Farrar targeting Lynn? I can reach into all sorts of conspiracy <laughs> theories, but I still don't think that the National Party, the government, and certain members of the Auckland community are over the fact that they still feel that the wrong man got the job. Yes, they really do. And thank do. goodness for that, yeah, because yeah, Len's they, doing yeah. a damn good job. Yeah, they really don't like mm. him much, do they? Fessa, South Auckland uh, gave, effectively, uh, Len the mandate to, uh, to, to run the city. Um, is he still communicating with South Auckland? What is the message they're hearing right now? Yeah, well, we see him. We, we have the mayor in the chair. He's yeah. out there. He's been in Manudera a lot. We know him. We feel like we own him still in yep. Otara. So yep. it's not like he's gone away from us. When you feel like you own someone, you've got to think of this as a family unit. Yep. He's still part of the family. So he never actually gets released. He can go and serve Auckland and all the people in North Shore and be nice to them, but he still belongs to South Auckland. Yep. That's how we see it. Yep. I think one of the issues here for me is this whole notion of spin doctor. And it gives off the impression that Len goes off at the end of the day, at about six o'clock, he calls these people together <laughs> and they have this secret meeting because that's what a spin doctor gives the people yeah. impression of, yeah. that he's getting together, you know, trying to scheme up some naughty plan. There is absolutely nothing naughty about what this council's been doing. What, we've, what we know is that, you know, you look at the council plan, the, the, the yearly plan that they have, this is a council that has tried its best to be as transparent as possible. They're not hiding behind people. And the reason why David Farr is attacking him is because he knows, as well as anybody else, that Len will win that election. It's the next one where there's going to be more of a challenge. The right have got no one to put up. Who, yeah. who are they yeah. going to go with? Christine Fletcher? Um, and, and, and even if they are plotting, what are they plotting about? Uh, public transport? Well, <laughs> I'm more for plotting of public transport or affordable housing. Why do you... What is, it, what is it that South Auckland wants to hear from Lee? What, what do they need to see from him to go, yes, you get my vote again? The sinking lid on, yes. on, the, on the pokies. They want to make sure that they can access tertiary education. Yep. So they're happy. AUT's out there, or in South Auckland at least, you've got MIT. So our people are thinking we don't have to always travel into town. And there's, because there's this big concept of what is the super city, we know South Auckland, we know Manukau City. That hasn't changed. Mm. And as long as he can still encourage that feel, because we're family-based people, mm -hmm. as long as you can encourage that small community of Manukau, of South Auckland, 
we're going to be fine. And I think the same is happening out west. Um, we, are, we are, of course, the largest Pacific Island city in the world. Mm. Do Pacific Islanders in South Auckland feel that they are getting represented? Their, their, their concerns are being represented by this, this mayor. I think uh, Len Brown, and I've forgotten his uh, chiefly, Samoan chiefly t title name, he got a, a matai from a village in Samoa. That is big accolade. Yeah. And so at least the Samoan community, and because we're the biggest community, the Pacific people understand that. So that is a high honour for him. We don't just give it to anybody, sure. except you know, giving one to John Keel is a bit of a bit. I think the people of South Auckland still have huge respect for Len Brown. He served Otara for a long time. He served us as a councillor on Manukau City. He was a great mayor out there. And people don't forget that. And I think that's going to take him right through. As long as he's standing, he'll, he'll get the South Auckland vote. How does, how does Len talk to 1.5 million people? Thank God he's got six spin doctors to help him. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, the reality is Len is, a, he's a fantastic communicator in his own right. But the challenge we've got is actually unpacking complex council information mm -hmm. and translating it into real people language. And that's, that's where we actually need, you know, sort of greater involvement. We need some more people to help us do that. Because to most people, the average kind of, you know, the, the life of council lives sort of somewhere else. It doesn't mm. live in people's, in people's houses. But with the unitary plan that we just, you know, finalised yesterday, that's where we really do need to encourage all of our community to participate. So, you know, we'll have Len out there talking to people, but we'll have the whole council out there on the streets, in houses, in, you know, in churches, mm. talking to people about the, the future plans for Auckland. Do you think the problem is not so much the way you're communicating the message, mm. but it's what you're saying? Because... You are telling Wellington they yeah. have to start investing into Auckland and they don't uh, want to hear that message. You know, the they most, don't want to hear that message. The most challenging thing is that what we're saying is actually about Auckland. We're not speaking the language of the left or the right. Mm. We're saying let's focus on what's good for Auckland and Wellington just sit up and listen because we've finally got a joined up voice. Mm. We've finally got policies and plans that are good for the entire Auckland region and we haven't given Wellington anywhere else to go you know they they need <laughs> it's it's wearing a little bit thin going oh it's lefty Len and his plans you know the developers love what we're doing in the unitary plan the community are pretty much behind it so we're saying let's find a way of actually getting Wellington to understand Auckland is pretty coherent and cohesive and speaking with one voice they need to listen was Fund the damn rail tunnel, for goodness sake. Was Stephen Joyce beaten up by a train as a child? Because I don't, <laughs> I don't understand. I think more a bad encounter with I, Thomas the Tank. I, I don't know man. what's happened here, but mm. he hates rail. And Why? Why? I, I think, again, it's looking through an ideological lens rather than a practical lens. And having taken, because I couldn't get the train this morning because I actually had to start too early, it took me an hour and 20 minutes to get from Swanson to Parnell. And that's just bonkers. Mm. So, you know, I think Stephen might need to spend a wee bit of more time here, understand what the community want, and realise rail isn't ideological. It's intensely practical and will make Auckland work. And for the south and the west, mm. give our community a more affordable future. When you consider the billions that uh, Auckland has given Wellington in terms mm. of of transport and road yep. funding over the years. We paid for we've, their roads. We, we, we've <laughs> barely had any of that yeah. infrastructure put back yeah. into us. When did they accept their responsibility? I think they're very frightened of being seen to be favouring Auckland. What they don't realise is around the country and as chair of the Metro Mayor's group, I know from our, our provincial mayors, they get it. They keep saying, for God's sake, why is the government not understanding the need to invest in Auckland, make Auckland work well, and the rest of New Zealand will work. You know, I think the government are a little bit behind the times. It's not favouritism. It's just a practical way to make sure that New Zealand is balanced. How is Auckland supposed to hold up the rest of the economy with Christchurch out of action, exactly. our second largest city, um, exactly. if we don't have the infrastructure being built here? <laughs> uh, final question to both of you on this then. Who will the right run? for mayor. Who do you think the candidate is? David Farrar was, was, was chastising the right, saying they haven't got themselves a, 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 an actual candidate yet. Who do you think will run? It'll be Christine Fletcher or Cameron Brewer. Oh, that's a very <laughs> dull choice. Both of those, exactly. really. Uh, well, babyface Cameron Brewer, he, he'll woo them, won't he, on the, on the North Shore, on the West? Cameron's far too smart to put himself up for something that he's going to lose, and he will absolutely lose the mayoralty. You can guarantee that. So who do the right to put up? I think they're scratching. Really? I really do. I, I think the difficulty is because 
the business community are actually fairly positive about what's happening in mm. Auckland. Mm. The word on the street is that they're quietly going, actually that land's not too bad, you know. Right. So they're not going to put a whole lot of money mm. up behind someone whose only response to everything is no. I think Auckland realises it's good to have mm. people with vision, it's good to have people with guts, and it's good to have people who actually understand where we're going. It's no longer appropriate just to vote against everything that, yeah. that Len says. People are tired of that. Let's wrap the show with final word. Penny, your final word this week is? I'm so proud of Auckland. The Pride Festival has been extraordinary. Mm. You know, being on the sideline for the, the Pride Parade along Ponsonby Road was just extraordinary and driving up and seeing the museum all rainbowed out was moving beyond belief. I mm. think we can be proud of ourselves. Amen. Uh, Afezo, your final word this week? The Bus Weeker Festival is coming up yes. in just a few weeks and I've just come from a meeting where we're organising the church service. It's going to happen to bring people together. Disappointed that Creative New Zealand uh, oh. withdrew some of their yes. funding for yes. the festival. And yes. We're, going, we're trying our best. There's even uh, messages on Facebook, people saying, oh, who's got a dollar or two or 20 uh, that can help out? But I think it's going to be a great festival, and this yep. is a chance for our people to shine and really make a name for themselves in Auckland. Maybe, yeah. maybe Lynn can help with uh, finding that money. I'm sure he will. Yeah. Thank you, Fessa. Thank you, Penny. Ladies and gentlemen, to my final words. So New Zealand won't actually be pulling out of Afghanistan like Key promised. 27 soldiers will remain in this occupation to prop up this corrupt narco state when you are occupying someone else's country. The way we are in Afghanistan, you have to justify every second of every minute, of every hour, of every day, of every week, of every month, of every year, you remain occupying it. 27 soldiers left in the country is 27 soldiers too many, Mr. Key. If you like tonight's show, please join our Citizen A Facebook site and connect with other like-minded new citizens and follow me on my Citizen Bomber Twitter and Facebook page. Thanks for watching, Fano. Good night, Aotearoa. Supporting local content so you can see more of New Zealand on.